uh, agenda that look at uh, individual actors and their interaction. And maybe, and this might be one of the problems or one of the issues we've seen uh, during this three-day workshop, is that looking at all of the actors in a given arena, which maybe we didn't necessarily do. And uh, to quote Philip Balzaguer, who's here, uh, who wrote in that edited volume saying that um, the dominant conceptualization of social movement activity resembles a tennis player firing balls against the wall. And this is kind of, might have been one of the issues we've seen in the past three days. So, without further ado, I'd like to thank again uh, Jim for accepting to be here and give us the closing uh, conference. And then we'll have a discussion and then go rest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, you've made my job harder by showing a comedic film right before I thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I do want to thank you all all the organizers, especially Yousef, for all the work you've done. Uh, I think it's been a great three days. I've heard, uh, I've heard a lot of very good, very interesting ideas. I'm going to go home, and as soon as I can, I'm going to steal as many of them as I uh, can remember. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, talk. Uh, I'm actually going to use this. I I'm glad I'm not the only one uh, who, to use this. Uh, I, I predict, predict that someday these, these, this technology will replace PowerPoint, um, but uh, not, not for a while. Um, I want to talk really about, start by talking about three different ways that we've, we've been thinking about how to insert individuals back into uh, social analysis. And um, I present to two. I may not be spelling, right? Uh, representative, uh, I'll start with that because it's in a way the way in which we have, the social sciences have thought about individuals uh, in the past. And then I want to talk about individuals as providing or inserting individual logics into organizations. That's come up, I think, in several of the, uh, of the papers. And then I want to talk about um, what I will provocatively call real individuals. And I know that will get me into trouble, but um, what I really mean is idiosyncratic individuals in something like their full fullness of uh, as, as human beings. Um, so I think, in my opinion, what we've been trying to do these three days with both individuals and events, and I will get to, in, to events um, later, um, is to try to dig beneath all the metaphors that we use in social science. And a lot of them are stale. Uh, a lot of them are unhelpful. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them, I think, simply, we don't really think about anymore. I and mean, that's, I guess, the nature of a stale metaphor. Um, but we, we have to, I think, try to look for things that we can actually see whenever possible. And that's why uh, individuals um, are, are very promising that way. Um, events, um, I'll argue if we think of them in the right way, more as actions or interactions, uh, have something of that same effect. Okay, anyway, representative individuals. Um, for years, what, we, what social science has tried to do with individuals is make each individual represent other individuals. Uh, we get random samples for surveys. We interview people who represent other people out there. And this has been the main way that we've dealt with it. We've reduced their idiosyncrasy. In fact, the, the, um, the cult of large numbers that dominates social science is in a, is in a way uh, an effort exactly to get rid of the idiosyncrasies of individuals, to strip out the errors, the error terms in, in a way. Um, I think everybody understands this principle, and I think um, it's been very useful, it's been very powerful, but it's also what we've been arguing against these last three days, uh, to some extent. Um, because there are also theories of the self that I would put, in a way, under the category of representative individuals. So the psychology, essentially, uh, assumes that by studying 20 college students in, a, in an experiment, they can say something about how human, the human mind works, how human beings work in a very general way. Uh, rational choice theory, very much a theory about the self, about individuals and how they work, but it's a theory that in a way smuggles in, well not smuggles, 
uh, has universalizing laws in there. Something there's something universalizing about individuals. It's not quite the same as as a random sample survey, but it fits, I think, in this traditional way of thinking about individuals. Um, the third uh, would be uh, the ag we can aggregate individuals. This is the economist's approach. You get you go out and if, you, you develop a theory of a market or a model of a market by simply through aggregation. This is how voting works in, in real life. In fact, you aggregate votes and so on. Um, all of the market transactions, all of the votes count the same. So individual idiosyncrasies in a way get wiped out once again. Um, uh, all right, so this is the first way of thinking about individuals. The second way um, is to see individuals as coming into organizations. It's very easy for social scientists, sociologists especially, to understand organizational structure, organizational rules, uh, the organizational charts of personnel, and so on. Um, so we, there's a tradition of using individuals to come in there who have a different way of viewing the world, um, or some kind of different logic of action. So for example, uh, whistleblowers. Uh, typically whistleblowers are, say, employees of a firm or somebody working in a formal organization who has been trained as a professional, say a professional engineer or a professional doctor or somebody like that, who has a very clear uh, training in ethics and in standards of whatever it is that they're producing, and that can clash with the organizational demands. Your company tells you, well, you have to build a bridge for X amount of euros. The engineer has the capacity to say, we cannot build a safe bridge. Uh, safety comes before cost. And this is the, the, the source of a lot of clashes that have been have been observed. Um, again, whistleblowers are, are a really good example. Another example is um, the notion of careers. Uh, individuals are carriers of their past, their biographical filters of various kinds of know-how, the things they've learned, um, their particular generational experiences, cultural meanings, habitus, all sorts of things that they, they carry with them in and out of organizations. So you can see a cohort perhaps moving in and out. You can see someone who's trained. I mean, an activist is a little bit like a professional, like an engineer. And they don't have the, the certificates typically, but they have the knowledge, the know-how, the experience that gives them uh, some way of judging the organization that they're part of, some alternative way of thinking about it. So again, there's an alternative logic that gets there, or counter logic, a new logic that can be inserted into organizations that way. Um, in both of these examples, um, they both sort of hark back to a field of sociology that has disappeared, namely the sociology of professions. This was at one time a very lively, interesting field. Uh, took a couple different forms. Um, Taku Parsons was very interested in the sociology of professions because it was profession, the professions and professionals who carry ethical norms with them into organizations. Um, uh, so, that's, so he actually wrote about professions and I think about whistleblowers at some point. Um, there's another tradition in the sociology of professions that comes out of the University of Chicago, which saw Elliot Friedson and people like that, which saw professions more as uh, political organizations, as self -interest, as interest groups promoting their own ends and so on. But again, um, promoting it vis-a-vis -vis in relationship to uh, state regulations, organizations, and so on. So again, the idea is that there are these two logics that we can see through these individuals that we can't see through simple organizational structure. Um, another way that we can think of this as an all, individuals as providing an alternative logic is as providing a kind of informal structure to go along with the formal structure of organizations. Um, uh, individuals 
remake the organizations they enter, remake, you know, often very literally remake, rewrite the organizational charts, the diagrams for the organizations. Founders obviously create organizational structures. We saw a very nice example of that with, uh, with uh, Ben Ali's regime and how he governed. Um, but that's true of all organizations, in fact. Uh, there's always the potential for somebody at the top to reshuffle organizations. So individuals can bring with them um, a different set of capacities that are not simply the power they get from their organizational position, but they get it uh, because they have their own personal networks, they have their own uh, resources perhaps that they bring to an organization, they have their own knowledge, uh, they have their own charm, they have all sorts of things they carry as individuals that can be independent of their organizational position. Um, okay, so those are, are several ways I think that individuals work as carriers of, of some kind of counter logics. Uh, again, it's, a, it's not, not anti-structural, but it's, um, it's against uh, the existing organizational structures at least. Okay, well that's well and good. Uh, all familiar, I think, to us. But what do, we, what do we do when we get to actual idiosyncratic individuals who've had long biographies where they've accumulated all sorts of meanings, all sorts of resonances, and so on? Um, we really haven't talked about them very much, partly because they really are hard to theorize. They, they are idiosyncratic, so what the hell are we going to say about them? Um, well, one tradition that does talk about them is traditions of, of uh, about um, uh, leaders. Uh, I don't think anybody's used the word leader. We heard leadership uh, today, but the actual there's a large literature on leaders, including psychobiographies and so on. Um, the reason is obvious. Uh, the term leader is very much out of fashion in the social sciences, or at least in sociology. Today, I went back and looked at the Handbook of Political Sociology from 10 years ago, um, just to, to check. And uh, the index had one reference to the word leader, uh, this very, very thick handbook, um, the one edited by Janoski and Alford and, and so on. <laughs> the, the one reference to leaders was to my own chapter where I complain about the lack of interest in leaders. So even that was to confirming. Uh, the problem. Um, I, I mean, I can understand the problem, especially in the U.S., where there is this cult of the individual. Um, there's also a cult of leadership, and I think this is why sociologists don't like to talk about leaders, because leadership is this, uh, is an idea promulgated by business schools and military uh, theorists that. Um, that's really, it's an excuse for giving more and more power to the quote-unquote leaders because they have these mystical powers of analysis, powers of decision-making that the rest of us don't. So there's this exaggerated cult of leadership, whatever that is. And so I think that the stigma of that for sociologists sort of then bleeds over into the term leaders. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about leaders either. What I would prefer to do is to talk about individuals, not surprisingly, for this conference, um, but this is sort of my language anyway. If you talk about individuals, you can ask whether they have influence or not. Uh, in other words, it doesn't have to be a formal leader, it doesn't have to be somebody who's recognized as a leader, but you know, in a certain local or not local scope, they can influence other people. So what I do is to talk about um, two kinds of individuals with two very different kinds of influence. Um, one is, uh, it's not a great term, but um, I'd love for some, to have suggestions. What is decisive leaders? Leaders who actually influence others because they make choices. They are in small groups or they themselves as individuals make a strategic choice to do this rather than that. Uh, they persuade 
the people in the room to go this way rather than that way. They, in other words, they have influence at uh, these sort of turning points or what I would call choice points at times in strategic life or social life. Um, this may or may not be because they have a formal position, sometimes informal, as we know from studies of fairly formless organizations, protest groups that can be decisive leaders even in these without any position that's official, but they manage to persuade other people. Um, that's one kind, the decisive leaders. Then there are symbolic leaders. And I think they have influence not, be, not necessarily because of what they do, the decisions they make, but because other people attribute meaning to them. So we see in them a symbol of the group, uh, this, a symbol of some moral position, a symbol of some kind of uh, tactical tradition, all sorts of things that we, we see in them. Now, often decisive leaders or decisive individuals and um, symbolic individuals are the same people. Presumably, you know, if you are the head of an organization, People look to you as a symbol of that organization, and you make decisions about the organization. But the two can diverge. Um, for example, when somebody dies, uh, they're no longer making decisions that we know of, um, but they're still symbols. They can be symbols for a long time. Uh, and in fact, there can be conflicts, controversies over what they symbolize. Um, there, are, there can be you know, if, uh, you know, if it's a prominent, uh, well-known person, uh, a political person, there are struggles over whether they were good or bad, whether they're the positive versus negative um, reputations that they have that are still the objects of struggle. So there are all sorts of other, I think, um, interactions between their symbolic influence and their decision-making influence. Uh, each can help the other. Um, but sometimes they can conflict as well. So that's a, that's a kind of language that I think gets us away a little bit from leaders, but also is a way to talk about particular individuals, whether they are the ones who are somewhere in a chain of strategic interaction and they're pushing the chain in this direction rather than that direction, or they are the objects of cultural work and understanding and, and symbolism. Um, uh, I want to now talk about um, a few traditions that have also talked about individuals. And they haven't, uh, surprisingly, they haven't really come up much, much today. Um, one is known as analytical sociology. How many people have heard of analytical sociology? Anybody? Okay, two? Yeah. Um, I was pretty stunned, uh, actually. Um, I decided last year, I think Peter Bierman had come and given a talk at, at CUNY, and uh, he's known as an analytical sociologist. So I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. I think Peter has it wrong in a lot of ways, but I'll teach a course in analytical sociology. So my seminar this semester is called Just That. Um, I, what I did not know is that Nobody else has ever heard the term, used the term. My students were really clueless about what I was really doing in the course. Um, I was lucky enough to get some students, not, not too many, but um, analytical sociology uh, was an effort 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, really by, an, if I correct me if I I think really mostly by rational choice theorists to um, carve out a chunk of sociology for rational choice theory. So what they said was, uh, we need to have a methodological individualism. Our descriptive language has to push down to the level of individuals. So one of the main figures, the main inspirations was James Coleman, who has a very famous, um, <coughs> various things. I prefer to think of it as a Coleman tub, because it usually comes down like this. And there are different ways to describe it, but essentially, um, one way is that you take a correlation between two variables at a sort of macro level. And all we can get at is this correlation. We don't really 
know much about the causation, how one thing leads to another. What he says, uh, said was, you drop down to um, a, another, the individual level of analysis. Um, and you see, well, what happens, really, at the individual level? And then you can sort of explain, come back up here and explain the macro outcome. He um, took it from Weber. Yeah, yeah, essentially, it's very, yes, it's very, yeah, I think that's right. Um, uh, I think it's a good idea. I think it's basically what we've been doing these last few days. Um, it, um, it really does force us to drop down to a different level, to, to the individual level. Um, the problems come in when you try to specify what that other level is. Um, typically, it's described as social mechanisms or causal mechanisms. People, have people heard that term? Or, okay. Um, probably because that term can mean anything. People use it in all sorts of different ways. But one of the, um, and you've certainly heard it from the work of Charles Tilley, McAdam, Tarot, and Tilley, uh, the dynamics of contention use mechanisms all the time. The, what, the way in which they use it is simply to um, take a general law and put it in one phrase or one term, brokerage. <laughs> they use it very differently from the way the analytical um, sociologists did, the way Coleman did. They don't drop down to the level of individuals. Brokerage can be at any level. It can be between countries. It can be between uh, firms that can be between individuals. So, in my opinion, it's a mess of a concept um, that we're unfortunately now stuck with associating with them, and it makes it less useful in the social movements field for sort of being true to the Coleman usage, which really the utility of it is you're working at an organizational level or a very broad <coughs> level and you drop down to a more, in my opinion, more observable level. Uh, so I would go with Jan Elster, the philosopher of rational choice here, who really does insist on a more psychological, uh, that this is at the psychological level. Merton talked about mechanisms, and they were simply middle range theory. But it repro that reproduces all of the problems of general theory, in my opinion. Um, okay. Uh, so mechanisms. Individuals are useful if we think of them as mechanisms. Uh, there are various ways to go from the macro down to the micro and, and back up. I've mentioned one, which is simply aggregating a lot of individuals. Um, the other is a matter of scope. Certain individuals make decisions that matter more than the decisions of other individuals, typically because of some official position or because they control media attention or something like that. So if uh, Barack Obama decide, makes a decision about you know, maybe going to war again or tax policy or environmental policy, that has a very broad scope because he makes a decision as President of the United States that puts in motion chains of interactions with all sorts of other individuals out to the armed forces, perhaps, then down through the armed forces all the way to uh, GIs at the level of privates and so on. Um, I can decide I'm going to do something about the environment, too. Um, it does not have quite the effect that uh, Barack Obama's decision to uh, make out the environment has. Um, I would have not come to this conference if I were really you know, making those kinds of decisions or something like that. I wouldn't fly somewhere. I guess. Um, okay, so let me move on. The other way, well, let me see. Those are, yeah, those are, I think those are the two main ways of of aggregating up that we use in, in social science from the individual back up to a more macro level. Ideally, and I think this is what we've seen in talking about individuals and events these few days. What we'd really like to do is trace out the whole chain of interactions between individuals. Barack Obama decides to do something. We follow the entire chain along 
down through the command or across bureaucracies. Um, Randall Collins talks about these chains of interaction, these inter interactive rituals. Um, uh, it's impossible to do that methodologically, essentially, especially for certain political players who have um, every interest in keeping secret their interactions and their decisions. Right? Just methodologically, we'll never see what goes on at the head of the US Army when they're deciding or preparing to go to war. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, that we should make a methodological limitation into a theoretical uh, statement. I think we need the theoretical statement about those chains of individuals, even though we recognize the methodological limits sometimes. Um, another body of literature uh, that's quite similar, I think, is actor network theory. Um, I like a lot of things about actor network theory because it tends to be very insistent on observing things that we can observe and not positing things like the social society, uh, social structure, all of these things that in fact are not things we'll ever observe. We'll only be able to construct them in our own scholarly way out of, out of other observations. So I like actor network theory for that. Um, I like the fact that it includes objects and not just individuals in the networks that it builds. The problem to me with actor network theory is it, this sort of provocative, uh, crazy uh, notion that things have agency, essentially, that they are actors just as humans are. Uh, it's, it's, it sounds great, it sounds like it gets people's attention. Um, the problem with it, I think, though, is that action is very tightly bound up with emotions. And I'll talk about emotions in a minute. Um, very briefly, you'll be very disappointed. Um, I, I think that emotions keep us in these interactions, keep us in actions and interactions, and objects don't have emotions. So they don't have any way of appraising how they're doing in those flows of action. They don't have the same way of reacting to other people, uh, I'll say, uh, in interactions or with other objects in the way humans do. So I think there's a huge difference that is really important for understanding action that, that actor network theory doesn't have. Um, let me just mention one more uh, piece of work, piece of theory that I think is helpful. Uh, sorry for walking back and forth. Uh, <laughs> it's just now occurred to me you were filming this. Uh, you were filming hardly. Um, uh, which is the work of Margaret Archer. I don't know whether people know her work. I think it's very interesting stuff. And one of the things that she talks about is uh, the internal conversation that individuals have. And she's worked for a long time on the problem of structure versus agency. And this is one of her, so this is her real solution to it, which is we need to get inside individuals' heads in some way because what they do in there is both have agency and structure. They have agency in the sense that they have projects, they have desires, they have things they want to accomplish, uh, they, have, they plan uh, actions and so on. But they also have structure in there in that they recognize the constraints that they're facing. They recognize, well, I can't do this because I would be blocked by that person. I don't have enough money to do something else. So that you get then structure and agency together in this sort of perceived, anticipated form in the internal conversation going on in all of our heads. I hope so. I'm not sure what your internal conversation is now, but um, I, I probably don't want to know. Um, but we all do that, and I think it's a plausible sort of psychology to use in thinking about uh, a lot of these issues of, of agency and structure. Okay. Um, all right. Next, I want to um, talk about um, uh, a sort of toolkit that we have for looking at some of these um, 
processes that go on in individuals, some of the elements of an individual approach. Um, these will be, these are all things we've talked about, I think, in the last few days, so I think they're all familiar. But one is simply meaning, cultural meanings. Uh, this is why we have, talk about biography, right? That people accumulate these meanings over time. Each, each, of, each individual has a, a totally idiosyncratic collection of meanings that we've filtered out of, the, out of all of our interactions through, through time so that um, individuals are not somehow asocial, pre-social. We're heavily social because we've had all of these interactions that have left us as certain kinds of people reacting in certain kinds of ways with a certain habitus, if we want to use that term, um, certain characteristic emotions, and so on. Um, another sort of grab bag of individual level mechanisms is, uh, is strategic choices. We've talked a lot about strategy over the last uh, few days. Um, I like to think in terms of strategic, not just strategic choices, but strategic trade-offs and dilemmas. The, there are dozens of, of them out there as we go about interacting with others, especially in political settings and political arenas. Um, we don't necessarily recognize when there's a trade-off, but if we do something without recognizing it, we're still going to get caught, in a way, on the trade-off. If we do this instead of that, we're still going to get some feedback, as it were, from going down this path rather than that path. But often we do recognize the trade-offs, and then the trade-offs, the strategic trade-offs, become strategic dilemmas. We have to think, do we want to do this, do we want to do that? And it seems to me the fact that they are dilemmas, and they really are genuine dilemmas. It's hard to come up with, each, of, each option has a pretty long list of costs, potential benefits, risks, and so on. And so it's often very hard to make, make the decisions. But the fact that there are these, these, these dilemmas means that we do have something that I would call agency left over. We do have some indeterminacy at the heart of strategic interaction. And I think that's, that's very characteristic of strategic systems. Um, and, and you get this when you look at um, advice books, strategic advice books. You look at them and you think, well, this is the dumbest 10 things I've ever heard. These are obvious. They tell me nothing about how to make a decision. And the reason typically, and this goes you know, across fields, whether it's business, military, uh, Saul Alinsky, all, all these people who've written sort of strategic advice books. Um, and the reason is, in the end, it has to be the person there in the moment in a very complex setting with a, a, a very minute sensitivity, fine-grained sensitivity to what's going on around her who makes that decision. And an outsider could never really say in advance, well, you've got to always go to the right and never go to the left or something like that in these decision trees. So, so anyways, strategic choices, strategic dilemmas. Um, I mean, we, talk, we were talking about Daughter or Nice earlier, a very typical one. They all have a lot of ramifications, actually. You know, there are a lot of possible outcomes with most of these, um, and I think we're, we, we're just at the beginning of research to sort those out and to see uh, why certain political players make one decision as opposed to another and what the, what the results are. Okay. Um, our emotions. Um, I really, I, I don't want to talk too much about emotions, even though they've come up a lot. Um, I'll just say that emotions are about individuals in contexts. And it's, it's, there are several contexts. Emotions tell us sort of how we're doing, uh, what we should look out for, what we should care about, what we should pay attention to in the world around us. Um, but it's not all social context, right? Um, I can, I can, you know, stump my toe on the chair and get angry at the chair. This is actually what I mostly get angry about. It's about the physical world. Uh, it's tr tricked me in some way, and I get angry about um, the pain that I 
feel it if I really stub my toe on the chair. Um, so we have reactions to the f emotions about the physical world. Um, something comes out of the shadows and I'm startled or scared until I real figure out what it is. We have emotions most obviously about the social world. Um, in interactions like this, we might we're anxious, we're processing information. I'm, uh, I'm looking in this direction, but I'm trying to figure out is anybody falling asleep over here? Uh, there are all sorts of ways in which we're processing information at a kind of subconscious level. Uh, and I, I think the, the problem has been that we tend to think, oh, well, thoughts are conscious and emotions are unconscious, or subconscious somehow. You know, in fact, we have dozens of feeling, thinking processes going on at all times, and both our, our cognitions, our moral judgments, um, and, um, and our feeling, what we traditionally call emotions, come out of these same raw materials in these dozens of feeling, thinking processes. So, at least as individuals, we're always juggling all of these things, 90% of which are never reach full conscious awareness. So, we were talking the other day about the difference between sentiments and emotions and so on. Uh, let me just say, in, in English, there is really no difference between mm -hmm. affects, emotions, feelings, uh, any of these sentiments, all of these words are pretty much interchangeable or vague. And if you go and you look them up in a dictionary, you get that wonderful circularity, pretty much there, they define themselves in terms of each other. So there's really no way out of this mess. Um, I suspect it, you know, in French there's, there's more of a differentiation between sentiments and you know, and so on, but um, it's, it's a terrible mess in English. So. One of our feeling thinking processes, however, is the labels we put on these bundles of feelings, right? So I, at some point, might think, oh, I'm really pissed off about that. And this uh, comes as a revelation to me. You know, my wife probably knew it before I did, in fact. But um, once I label this, I'm angry, that in itself then sort of readjusts all of the other feeling thinking processes. And I you know, might get even angrier, I might get redder in the face. Or if I decide, well, I'm not angry, I'm, I'm exhausted. You know, that might send me, send my body, send these feeling thinking processes in a slightly different direction. But the label, which is very important, because we talk in terms of emotions and we recognize emotions, but it also is just one of many and they all feed into each other. This is what has happened in the, in the neurological study of emotions, right? That, where they put people on these functional MRIs and they try to see where the emotions are. Um, what the neurologist had hoped was, well, we, oh, this part of the brain is for fear. Uh, over here we can see love. Uh, here we can see hate and all. Well, and they did this for a while. They talked about the limbic system and the more primitive systems. What they found out as they did better and better scans was that any serious emotion label, like any of those, lights up a whole bunch of dozens of places in the brain and they interact with each other, right? They're, so that there are processes that go on as all of these various feeling thinking processes happen. Um, anyway, that uh, I think is an important part of watching individuals move through action, interact with each other. Um, some emotions are quite long-term, uh, love, hate, uh, trust, respect. I think those are emotional, uh, emotional relationships we have with other people that are often very permanent. So that's part of the biographical filter that we, we have for thinking about individuals. Um, uh, I'm going to rush a little bit because uh, I think we started five. Uh, so I've, been, I've already been going for 40 minutes, I better. Um, I've, I've been using the language of players and arenas because I think it's a way to make sense of a lot of the issues, especially over agency and structure that we've been dealing with. Um, Yusef mentioned this book. Thank you. 
Um, it's free, uh, open access uh, from uh, either my website on academia.edu uh, or Amsterdam University Press. So players, um, I'm, by, by players I mean both individuals and teams, groups of individuals. And it's kind of interesting because you can work upward to very large groupings of individuals. You can work back downwards from nations to parties to factions within parties to families to end all the way back down to individuals. And I think some of what we've been talking about, what we've seen the last few days, is this process of people thinking more as a collective player, compound player, or less, going back to individuals. But I think it's a, it's a useful language for talking about who really interacts <coughs> with, with whom. Arenas um, are actual physical places, in, in my opinion. they are rooms like this. They have doors, they have windows, they've got recording devices, they have places to sit. They limit the number of people who can be physically present, but they also have technologies for letting people observe in a mediated way. I think, you know, and this I think is sort of Latourian in a way. They are, they do constrain what we can do and what our expectations are. All these desks are nicely facing this way and all the chairs expecting somebody to stand up here or sit up here and talk that way. There are all sorts of subtle and not so subtle ways that these arenas shape that is how we make decisions, what kind of action we do in them. Uh, probably doesn't matter a lot what we do here this afternoon, but if we were, uh, say, an assembly room uh, with certain kinds of seats, certain kinds of room for spectators, that might make more of a difference. Uh, we might have nice marble walls with famous sayings chiseled into them to remind us what we're supposed to be doing as politicians and so on. So players make decisions in arenas according to certain rules, rules that they can break. Um, and as I said yesterday, to me a crisis is when one of those arenas stops working or maybe a whole sequence, <coughs> a whole collection of those arenas stops working properly or the way they used to. And they have to be rethought. Rules have to be rewritten. Arenas are abandoned. New ones are invented and so on. But it gives us some kind of, it's not objective measure, but some kind of yardstick for looking at crises and how they, how they get resolved. Um, okay. Um, what I want to end with is talking about events, because um, I, I can't resist. I came here without any opinion about events whatsoever. Um, you know, my interest is really in individuals. But I want to argue that we can think about events in much the same way, as in a parallel way to these ways of thinking about individuals. Um, that, for one thing, events can be representative events. We all know about event history analysis, where you go out and you try to find typical events or as many events as you can. Again, the, the, end, you know, the larger the end, the better. Uh, and these are representative of some kind of action. And you put them all together in this nice data set and correlate them with other things that you've measured. So that's sort of the traditional way of, of treating events in sociology. Uh, Tilly's Tilly started doing that in the 1960s, so it has a, has a fairly old history. Then there's this notion that you can insert a new logic, an alternative logic into, into things. So this seems parallel to transformative events when uh, there are openings in structures that allow you to change the structures, um, when they become more vulnerable to creativity, agency, if you want to call it. Um, something new is available at certain times. Again, it could be the paralysis of an arena, it could be changes in opinion, all sorts of things. It could be externally imposed crises like uh, a fiscal crisis or a, a military invasion. Then I think, though, uh, there are also idiosyncratic events, real events, I would call them. Um, instead of 
leaders and founders of organizations as we have with individuals, uh, we have something like um, uh, the magic wand image of events that somehow they are going to transform things in this magical way, sort of, sort of the equivalent, the event equivalent of leadership. There's a bit of mysticism to it. Uh, we don't really buy it, but I think there's a parallel with how you analyze events that way. Then you have decisive and symbolic events. Um, events push decision-making, push the rules, push the structures in one direction or another. Events also have a symbolic character. We think about events. We use them in our imagination. They, they represent, they symbolize all sorts of things to as much as individuals do. Um, so we have a lot of the same uh, ways of dealing with events that we do with individuals. Just as you can take uh, just as you can take players and you can look inside a collective player for the factions, you can break it down into what's going, you break it down, you break it down, you break it down until you get to individuals. Right? Well, that's what you can do. You can do something like that with events. You can take the French Revolution, and well, we can break it into three phases. Well, we can look inside each of those phases and we can find a whole number of other you know, little events inside. And we can break that down and we can see events at the level of a neighborhood or we can see events at the level of a family or an individual, two individuals interacting. Maybe we can break the events down in that same way that we can with players. Um, I, would, I would say, I would link this back to what I said about Margaret Archer, too. Um, events are really only events if we see them that way in our, as part of our internal conversation. Um, if they, we have to notice that they're events, we have to have certain emotional reactions to them, we have to be excited by them, or at least pay attention to them for them to be events. So it's much like um, how she talks about agency and constraints. Um, and just as some individuals are more important, so some events are more important, either decisively or symbolically. Um, and they can change in importance over time. They can become less important. Uh, their, their effects can sort of die out. Their effects can stay the same. Their effects can accelerate over time. Uh, the symbolism can die out. We can forget about them. Or the symbolism can remain really important because it's useful for thinking of 1789 remains important X number of years later because we can think in different ways about the French Revolution. Okay. Um, anyway, let me just end by saying, um, in both cases, we work up from very little things. Individuals, maybe even what's going on inside individuals, interactions between individuals, um, which are, in my opinion, events, the building blocks of, of bigger events. Um, we don't assume that we know what is what an important event is, what who an important individual is, until we actually follow them empirically for a while, and then we see, we don't assume, oh, she's the head of this organization, she's the one who matters, right? We go and we look, and maybe she's, maybe she's the symbolic head of, the, of that organization, maybe she's the decisive head, maybe she's neither, right? So you look at actual people. Um, and this forces us, I think, down to a very observational level. It's hard to do, often, for a lot of the kinds of things we care about, because it's hard to build back up and put them all back together. But it provides an ideal for how to do social science at a level where we can sort of agree that a table exists, an individual exists, some interaction exists. And that gets us um, past a lot of the weird metaphors that are nothing but intellectual fads and fashions. Thank you.